Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With the salutation of St. Gabriel the angel, O our Lady Mary, peace be unto you. You are a virgin in your thoughts and a virgin in your flesh. Blessed are you amongst all women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Of your womb. Rejoice, joyful one, for God is with you. Pray and beseech your beloved Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may grant us mercy and forgive us our sins. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Hello again, Deacon Meherat. Great Hello. to see your face. It's good to see you. Uh, happy Kadamisur. Happy Holy Saturday. Amen. Amen. Happy Holy Saturday to us all. I think it's something like a pleasant Saturday or something. Would, um, but yes, have, have a wonderful Holy Saturday. How's it been going for you? It's been going, uh, doing very good for me. I mean, you know, this Saman Hamamat, a lot of meditation, contemplation uh, on the passion of Christ. How is it with you? It's been going well, you know, as well as it can be. You know, we don't, we don't want to head to two bad extremes. The one extreme is to despair at how bad the situation is. And then the other is to be almost so cheerily hopeful that it comes off as, as fake or hypocritical. You know, we are happy, we're filled with joy because we're commanded and instructed to be filled with joy at all times. But at the same time, we understand the gravity of the situation that we're in. So, you know, all things, let me say with the caveat or with the asterisk, all things considered, you know, it's going well. We have great live streams. Today I got to check out the wow. live stream from Mambaraz Awao Tukadusilase or from the throne of the Cherubim, Holy Trinity's Cathedral, the famous cathedral in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where our Archbishop, Abu Namal Edik, for decades was Lika uh, Sultanat or the chief amongst authorities, even during the time of the king. Yeah. I checked out that live stream as well. I didn't finish it, the Mahadit, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not, it looks it looks very uh, beautiful. Yeah. Okay, we got, the, we got the blessing of the laborers who come at different hours. In fact, in the Greek tradition, they're famous. I, I, if I'm, you know, let any Greek folks correct me if I'm wrong, but they are famous for reading the Paschal homily of St. John Chrysostom, yeah. the golden mouth. And in that, you know, he's often quoted as saying, whatever hour you get here, just rejoice, be grateful, and realize you will, you will get a wage from the Lord. So I, I'm sure you and I, however much we were able to attend from, from this far away, it's miraculous that we're even able to attend. I was on an Instagram um, video chat with one of my friends, in Addis Ababa, one of our old Sunday school teachers, uh, and we, he was in his living room in Addis Ababa watching it while you were watching it at your home while I was watching it. So it's the same one spirit with all of us that allowed us to worship at the same time to attend. I mean, that's true. Very true. The same teaching. Yeah. So why don't you start us off? I feel like I, I was, uh, well, uh, I, I mean, last time. we can, we can start off anywhere, but, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, I think it's good if we start off with uh, where we are now, what we're celebrating right now. So, you know, uh, this is the last day of Samun Hamamat. And we didn't have an opportunity before to actually, you know, talk about a lot about the Samun Hamamat, about the passion, suffering of Christ, you know, ultimately ending yesterday on Good Friday with his, um, uh, with his crucifixion and death on the cross. And now we're here on, uh, you know, Kanami Ur, which is, also a big feast, the big Ba'ad in Ethiopia, which is a celebration of his, you know, being in the tomb, of him descending to hell, as we'll talk about later on. And then all of that ends with, you know, the upcoming resurrection tomorrow, which starts at midnight, of course. Um, so that's a lot of events that we haven't covered. And so I was thinking, you know, we should, we should start by just talking about, in general, the meaning and uh, the value of what Christ did for us through his suffering his crucifixion, his death, his descension into Hades, and his resurrection for all of us. Uh, and 
I think we should probably start, I think, since that's a lot of things, <laughs> start with the first big event, and that's his crucifixion on the cross. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, when people are asked, what's the value of the cross? Why was the Lord crucified? We like to just answer with these platitudes, these cliches, and we don't actually understand the value of the cross and what the cross means uh, for those of us that are believers. So uh, I think the first question we can discuss is, what is the value as Orthodox Christians of commemorating the crucifixion of Christ within the story of salvation? Yeah. I was like, you're going to answer that one? Or? <laughs> I, I was thinking, you know, you, you could start and then uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll hop so, in. <laughs> first and foremost, if I may quote the famous podcaster and comedian Joe Rogan, he, he pointed this out one time. I think he himself may have been quoting another stand-up comedian, Lenny Bruce. And he said, a lot of times people view the cross as an ornament, like you said, not understanding the full value of what it is that's going on. It's as a platitude. It's an assumed set of facts, you know, something that someone's going to put in a creedal formula and think that everything's going to be a-okay without mm -hmm. having any follow-up faith, which is the utmost trust we discussed last time and the action that mm -hmm. goes along with that faith or is that faith working through love. And one of the things that he said is, to get a better picture, we need to analogize what it is because this is that Roman imperial symbol of the death cult, that, that tree of death, which is striking fear into everyone to let people know, don't mess with Rome. Don't mess with this earthly power. And the Lord converted that tool and he christened it. He baptized it with his own precious blood to turn it into a tool of glorification and mocking of death. In fact, later on, we'll talk about how he put death to death. He trampled it. So what the comedians were saying is that in a more modern example, because you don't see people getting crucified all the time with the, with the exceptions of the, the nonsense that Daesh was doing in, in the Middle East and in the Near East and in North Africa, what you see is firing squads in the 20th century you see the noose and then more and commonly the now people think yeah the electric chair and now people um think it's sanitary but there are a lot of problems and issues with with people writing in pain as well with the administration of a needle yeah lethal injections so imagine if someone had a, a bracelet or a necklace that had you know a, a poison needle on it an electric chair on it a firing squad member, you know, from the Nazis or something like that, or a noose, you know, I mean, it would be absolutely appalling to people. It would be shocking. And it's almost as if we've been desensitized to the cross because it's so separate from us in time and place. So the number one thing is in order to value what it is that our Lord did for us, we have to realize with examples that hit closer to home how gruesome it was that he was crucified. One, one of my friends in social media was, was sharing because someone was asking, how is it actually that he died? And I, I never actually knew the, the particulars or something like this. And he said, the best educated guess is probably while gasping for breath with his ribs unable to contain it anymore, which is, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just horrifying. I know a lot of people sure. watch Mel Gibson's A Passion of the Christ during this time to, to get that picture too. Yeah, I mean, I want to hop in here since please, uh, please. You, you brought it here in talking about the gravity of the cross. I mean, it's important I just, just to give some historical background for those that are listening right now about the gravity of the cross. The first thing I want everyone to realize, right, is that, that the Roman Empire, for all its cruelty, for all its inhumanity, was so horrified by the gruesomeness of the cross that it did not allow its own citizens to receive crucifixion as a death penalty. That's the first thing. And the big example is, right, St. Peter and St. Paul. St. Peter was not a Roman citizen. St. Paul was. Both of them were found guilty of the same thing, being a Christian. One was crucified and one was not um, because of their citizenship. So that's just talking about the gruesome. Second, right, when someone is sentenced to crucifixion, it's not just getting on the cross. The whole steps, right, is part of the gruesomeness. It starts with, you know, being scourged, being whipped, the whips that the Roman soldiers used to whip, you know, their victims had pieces of bones, pieces of metals, right? Our fathers, when talking about the scourging of Christ, say he was whipped so much his bone could be seen. And then 
they make you carry the own in, your own instrument of death throughout the cross. That's the psychological humiliation. Oh, yeah. And then, like you talked about, the asphyxiation, right? So when they put you on that cross, the first thing is your 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 arms get your shoulders get dislocated. Your arms become um, stretched out by up to eight inches each on each side. So what happens is your lungs really start getting torn apart and you're subjected to this long and torturing death until you can no longer breathe. And if you know, if you haven't bled out by then. And so all of this gruesomeness is one of the reasons why in the English language, we refer to extreme pain as excruciating, right? That's, that's deriving from the, the word cross, cruciating, excruciating pain. And that's one of the reasons why also within the church, for the first you know, couple decades, the cross was not the symbol of Christianity because even for believers, it was just too hard to use such a gruesome symbol as a symbol of a triumphant faith, which is why for the first couple decades, it was the fish that was used as a symbol of Christianity. And then later on, after the horrors of the cross had uh, in some way um, been reduced in the minds of the Christian, that the cross came more into Christian iconography and art. So that's just to talk about the gravity of the cross. Um, so what you said is definitely true. But if we were to just stay on there, though, that would be sad. <laughs> Very sad, sad. But like you said, what's so beautiful about the mystery of the cross is that he takes this cross, this horrifying, excruciating, gruesome form of death, and he transforms it into an instrument of glory. That's why in the Gospel of John, uh, I'm sure you know, but for those of us that you know, haven't closely read, the Gospel of John references the crucifixion of Christ multiple times as the glorification of Christ. Christ had not yet been glorified. Oh, yeah. I will glorify you. I have glorified and I shall glorify. So this glorification of Christ is the cross. So he transforms the suffering into a cause of mockery of Satan and triumph for us. Um, yeah, so back to you. Just you know. Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the Hosanna reading. It's in John chapter 12. In the, the first set of verses from about 1 to 11, you have um, Mammon, the s evil spirit or deity or demigod of money, being worshipped by Judas Iscariot in talking about why would Mary pour such expensive fragrances upon the Lord that, that is so much of her salary, right? I think we discussed that in regards to Hosina and Palm Sunday. And then later you, you see in the Palm Sunday reading, it says that the apostles didn't understand a lot of things until he was glorified, exactly as you said, referencing that. And, and in fact, when we go back and we read Numbers, there's the analogy of the Son of Man needing to be like the serpent on a stick. We have the functional serpents. We have the serpents that are evil in the eyes of the people because they're sent after them when the people are disobedient to God. But then we have the serpent who's on a stick and is startling to people who only flip through the Bible and not really uh, ready to dig deep because they think, oh, serpent bad. But no, serpent not always bad. Serpent could be a sign of the devil, but serpent could also be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being glorified. So the fact that he would take on even this imagery that so many people associate with the devil or with Satan, and that so many people associate with so many uh, bad things like the fall of humanity and, and so on and so forth. He takes that himself as the image which he is going to convert because he's always converting tools. For him, everything's a functional. For, for in, in someone else's hands, it's villainous. In his hands, it becomes heroic. So a, a serpent from someone else is villainous. To him, it's heroic. The cross in the hands of the Romans, who are just one representative of how human beings want to build empire, just another extension of the Tower of Babel, right, from Genesis chapter 11. In the Roman hands, just like in any imperialist hands, the cross or any instrument of putting people to death is something villainous. But in his hands, it becomes a heroic way to grant life to everyone. But I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Where are we sequentially in, the, in where you want to head next after the... No, I mean, no, I, I, I think uh, we can move at our own pace. But before we know, we move on to the next step, right, of, uh, of that redemption. There's a couple of things I want to note. First, I just want to read a verse from Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And so that can be interpreted in many different ways. But in the context of Good Friday, what I wanted to point out here is 
whatever God uses, whatever God takes to be his own, automatically becomes good, automatically becomes holy. So what happened is Adam rejects God. Adam brings in sin and its byproducts, which is you know, suffering and death, into the world. And the world becomes fallen. And multiple times, numerous times, we try and get back to our place of grace, which is we try to form a relationship with God. That's what salvation means. Salvation simply means to have union with God because we are mortal. And so without God, we can't have that eternity unless we have union with him. So we try to meet God halfway and we're not able to do that. So what does God do? God comes all the way. He comes to where we are. He meets us in our place of suffering. And so he takes that which is, which is humiliated, which is fallen, and having made it his own, he makes it work for good, like Paul says in Romans 8.28. Amen. And so that's why one of my favorite verses, or not verses, but sayings, is from the Holy Father, St. Athanasius, who says, God became man so that man could become God. So the salvation that we see in the cross is that Christ is here with us. He's not looking from the sky laughing at us. He came here, that is God, the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords, and he shares with us in our suffering. And by sharing with us in our suffering, he's given us salvation just by his presence with us. And furthermore, he has allowed for us to take our own suffering and give it to him and let, it, let him turn it into an instrument for good. Because, you know, on that cross, it's not just his own suffering that he's shouldering. It's the suffering of any person and every person from Adam to the last man. It's the suffering of the entire world. So it's infinite suffering that he's shouldering on his on his great shoulders for our own triumph. Uh, and that, that's the beauty of the salvation of the cross. Anything else you want to add? I mean, yeah. I mean, oftentimes in the English language, we have a saying that we are on the shoulders of giants. There is no one more giants. You called him the king of kings, the lord of lords, the god of gods. I'll add another title to him. He's the giant of giants. I mean, and we are forever on his shoulders in anything that we do so that we cannot boast in anything, that we must be humble if we want to be exalted. We mm. must be last if we want to be first. And we do that by putting him at the forefront, by reading the scriptures aloud, like, like you said, and, and trying to live lives worthy and, and according to that, always growing in, in holiness, because he told us to be holy as he is holy, to be growing in perfection, as he said, to be perfect as he is perfect. And so we're trying to reduce our sin count, as Abba Thomas always says, so that we could be more and more and more and more like him. Not that we're going to become him, but that the Christian life is about approaching the standard that he set forth for us. I mean, that yeah. ultimately culminates in, in death. You know, if we fulfill the Christian instructions fully of loving our neighbors, strangers, and enemies, we should not be surprised if we end up going on wood. And hopefully, as Father Berrigan, a great American Catholic priest, uh, anti-war priest, used to say, if you want to follow Jesus, you better look good on wood. Mm. That's, that's very true, very true. And, you know, just for all of us now, 2020 Christians, in the midst of this pandemic, we shouldn't like, there's like a lot of people out there that are saying, you know, this pandemic is because God hates us. He's cursing us. He's punishing us. That's not the Orthodox view. Uh, and Good Friday is, a be is the best example of that. And that what we should understand when we look at this pandemic, when we look at the suffering around us is that, yes, the suffering is here. The suffering is abounding. But as followers of the cross, we have to look at that suffering and understand that through Christ, we make that suffering, that weakness, our strength our triumph by believing and trusting in him and understanding that all things work for good, that we are like, um, like a rock that's being fashioned by a sculptor into a beautiful sculpture. And so throughout life, we will meet suffering, but we shouldn't meet it with, uh, with a defeated attitude, but rather with the triumphant attitude that we as Orthodox ascribe to the triumphant and glorified Christ on the cross. I, amen, amen. You know, it's almost uh, that triumph or trumping might become uh, a dirty word in this day and age because people might associate it with a ruler here or a leader there. But being triumphant, being victorious is, like you said, fundamental orthodox theology. It's orthodox theology 101. I want to read a quote from one of our 
fathers amongst the saints, a Syriac saint known as Marisak or Isaac of Nineveh, Isaac of Nineveh, of course, in Iraq, or Isaac the Syrian, you know, that greater Syrian desert region, the land where Paul in Galatians tells us he was just sowing the seed for 14 years, you know, and, and barely even consulting the other pillars of the apostles at that time after Jesus was directly revealed to him that we hear about in Acts. Um, Marisak is from that community. He's from that community of people who had received the Orit before, like we Ethiopians have, who had strong Jewish presence. And so there was this great Semitic understanding of scripture that was unique and unadulterated by some of the later over philosophizing that some of the other folks of Byzantium got themselves caught up into. And what he would say about victory and love is a lot of times people focus on, on sin. You know, Jesus had to come here, especially in an American uh, Protestant environment, you could probably imagine. Jesus had to come here because we were dirty sinners, right? We were just absolutely wretched people, and that's why we had to come here. What Marisak does is he looks at the cosmos, and he sees the love behind the author of the cosmos. He says, regarding the incarnation or his, his, uh, the birth of Christ, the birthday of Christ, but it could be extended from his birth all the way through his crucifixion and to his resurrection, ascension, and his sitting at the right hand of the Father and eventual return to come and judge the living and the dead. He says about the incarnation, God did all this for no other reason except to make known to the world the love that he has. So rather than zooming in on, yes, we're sinners, but rather than zooming in on that, it's like a different perspective. It's like what Paul says in Hebrews, he was unashamed to be called our brother. You know, God was one of us. Emmanuel, the Lord was with us or God was with us. He came to be with us. Like you said, just, just being with us is why he came. And if we realize how in our liturgical rubric, it says that his love yanked him and dragged him from the throne above of the heaven of heavens to be with us. It, it's, it's this miraculous, mystical, just incomprehensible and mind boggling love that we have to understand. He did all of that not to go to Disneyland, but to go to Golgotha, yeah. to go to the place of the skull, to go to Calvary. Mm. All that because he loved us. It was, it was love that, that drew him. But as you said, it was a victory. But it was a victory that is unlike a lot of the human victory. I want to read for us, if you'll permit, Colossians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. In Colossians chapter 2, I think I can invite everyone to go read at least, you know, 1 to 11 in, uh, at home. And I'll begin at 11 and go on to about 15. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. That's Wasat at Amas Homu. Yes. Monday's um, Dasi Maryam or Maryam. He, he shredded it. It's, it's a malikat, it's a ta'imrit, it's a sign that's a, used as a musical note. It's such a famous passage in the Ge'ez, right? Everyone says, wasat ata, and everyone assumes, you know, they know. And he shredded that certificate of debt for us. And it comes here from uh, Colossians chapter 2. So he did that, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. If we went and saw someone beat up, like the story of the Good Samaritan and left on the side of the road, we would come and say, hey, we need to give that person a helping hand. But here, when it appears to everyone that Jesus is beat up, 
What is actually going on is that the invisible principalities and powers, the evil forces in high and low places that is, are talked about in, later in, in Ephesians as well, are being put to shame. Mm. He's, he's dancing on them. He's yeah. mocking them. He's scoffing them. And that, that's the beauty of the triumph that you were discussing. And, and you know, this actually is a perfect segue into the Holy Saturday, the subject of Holy Saturday. Because, right, the, the salvation which our Lord does for us, the, the feeding of the, of the principalities of the darkness, doesn't stop on Friday. It continues into Saturday because today, and I'll talk about what that means later, we're commemorating the dissension of Christ into Hades, into the abode of the principalities. And so our fathers, they love to talk about um, this beautiful analogy for what Christ did in Hades. And so what they say is, our Lord, being fully God and fully man, showed the extent of his humanity on the cross, showed weakness on the cross, and so convinced Satan in his foolishness to think that he had actually won the battle. And so having descended into Hades, Satan comes to claim his trophy, to claim his prize, and that's when our Lord reveals the extent of his divinity. And so when Satan and all those demons and all those principalities in Hades see the divine light of the triumphant Lord, they become blinded. And the best analogy I'll use here is if you are sleeping, right, and then, you know, your mom or your dad comes and turns on the light, for a split second, you won't see anything. It's just like blindness because your eyes have to adjust to see that kind of light. And these demons being in infinite darkness will never have time to adjust to the infinite light of our Lord. And so these principalities are blinded because our Lord, through his weakness, is able to show the extent of his strength. And having done that, he takes all those souls in hell, in Hades. He preaches to them and he leads them from their, you know, he leads them out of their chains, out of their enslavement in Hades and brings them to paradise. He brings them to his kingdom. And that's the beauty of what you're talking about. And that is, it seems like Christ is getting beat up. But really, who's getting beat up is these principalities. And that's why I, I want to read for you. You know, you're talking about Colossians. I have another verse from Colossians I would like to read. Uh, it's Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, that is Jesus, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the question is, did, did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Not necessarily. No, he died for us. He died for us. It wasn't for the purpose of sin. Sin was just a stepping stone to him being able to have a relationship with us, to him being the winner and the victor and making us also victors along with him. So uh, that's the beauty of this feast we're celebrating today, the feast of his dissension, Holy Saturday. Anything you want to add on while we're on there? Yeah, can you still hear me? Yeah. So I am really appreciative. Um, I, I thought you weren't going to say hell at all. It was funny. You started by Hades. What's brilliant is um, I'm, I'm going to go on a, on a very brief, like, philological or word-based tangent, and you have to just uh, bear with me for the audience. But there have been a lot of mistranslations in English, and so we have to do our best to return to the original languages. In Scripture, that means Hebrew, Greek, and at some times Aramaic, but predominantly Hebrew and Greek. Hades, what Deacon Mehrat is saying, is a Greek word. The Hebrew equivalent, which we say in Amharic often and in Ge'ez, is Seol or Sheol, and that is talking about the same place. All of it is in reference to a place called the place of the dead. There is a real place that's grounded in reality that is used as an illustration for a place that is beyond, for a place where you have the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have a chasm beyond which, or a canyon beyond which, other folks are. This is for the here and now. I hear some people, even in their hymns, I, I say this with all love and all respect, but we need this as we're growing as a church in North America to be clarified, where people talk about Jesus going to hell. And it's not correct. If it's a slip of the tongue, it's one thing. And other people, though, are, are you know, broadcasting it a lot. And I just don't want that to be, you know, seeping into the minds of our hearers, especially the impressionable youth. Because our Lord and Savior cannot go to hell 
because hell is not open. Hell is a lake of fire that will be prepared for people on Judgment Day. And there are a lot of different interpretations about even that situation amongst our fathers, but it's a far off day for when Judgment Day happens, for when he comes back to judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever died. But as for now, as our brother Deacon Maharad said, he descended into Hades, he descended into Sheol, he descended into the place of the dead, and he preached life to them, and he yanked them out of there. There are these great icons in our tradition of him holding hands of, of Adam and Eve, and, and some of the lines that the Greeks use, you know, he burst asunder the bars or the chains, the gates that were there. It's, it's, so, it's so exciting. Like, you, you just want to jump out of your chair when you hear of his triumph so that's that's all i wanted to uh, clarify regarding no, thank you that. yeah it was a slip for me i i always try to stick with the hades same with you because that that's a thing but that's i think a topic for another day we can really yeah. get into what's hades or what is hell there's a lot of interesting um theology under there but for the now they could just know that it there that there is a distinction of course yeah but uh the b important thing is our lord descended into the place of the dead and he freed them from their from their chains to the to the dark principalities, and he blinded those dark principalities. Uh, and as I you know read for here in Colossians, he reconciled the entire world within himself by his blood. That's that's the beauty of of the cross, of his ascension, of the resurrection. All of this is Christ becoming Dagmai Adam, the second Adam. The first Adam was chosen by God to become the representative of the cosmos, of the world, of the universe. And he failed miserably. The second Adam, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through his blood, was able to buy back the world, to ransom back the world by his precious and, uh, and life-giving blood. And he was able to claim not just those that are here walking on the world, you know, uh, on the ground, but also those that were under, those that the saints of the Old Testament that had been claimed by, by, by the serpent. And he was able to make Hades empty. That's the, the beauty of it. And finally, as St. Paul says, he was able to make peace to the cross. He made peace between us and God the Father. He became our mediator, our, our high priest. And that's why one of the names for Saturday is Gavra Salam, because Kedus uh, in one of his uh, whatevs, one of his uh, hymns for today, for Holy Saturday, says, he, he quotes St. Paul, says, Gavra Salam Bamaskad. So he made peace through his cross. Uh, that's the, the beauty of, of today. And then, I guess before we move on to the Feast of Feasts, one thing I would like to add is, uh, I've been using this term, K'namis Ur, K'namis Ur, again and again and again. What does that mean? In English, it simply means, uh, uh, well, K'nami obviously means Saturday, but the word Su'ur, I don't know what the direct translation means, but what it essentially means is uh, the broken Saturday. Is, a, is kind of a transition I would give to it. I don't know do you have, if you have a better translation in English. I don't know what the direct. I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. I, I can't hear you a little bit, your volume. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to look it up. I'm not, I'm not familiar. Yeah, but essentially what's it, what it's referencing, the name of this Holy Saturday is, um, for those of you that, that know, some of you that don't know, right? Saturday is a Sabbath. It's the first Sabbath, the Sabbath of the old. And our God, you know, God established this in Genesis when he rested on the seventh day, on the last day. And so ever since then, the Sabbath has, has been commemorated, uh, both by the Jews and even us as Orthodox Christians, we commemorate Saturday. During the regular time, Saturday is one of those days when there's no fasting. And by fasting, what I simply mean is there is no uh, abstaining from food until three or whatever time there is, right? You have breakfast on Saturday, whether it's feasting season, whether it's fasting season. That's one of the ways we commemorate Saturday. There's always uh, on Saturday in Ethiopia. I don't know if we can do that really in the uh, in the diaspora, but you know, during uh, in Fatanagas, it says that one of those days that you always have to have liturgy is Saturday. But this is this Saturday is the one day of the year where we fast Saturday. The whole day is fasted, so the Sabbath is broken. The Sabbath uh, is not observed on this day, which is where the word sur comes in handy, and. We fast this Saturday first in anticipation of, of the Eucharist, which we'll receive on midnight when our Lord rises again during the Paschal liturgy. But second, it's also 
to understand that our Lord this day was in Micah, in the middle of the earth, was not eating anything. He was dead in the flesh. And in the soul, he was down in Hades freeing souls. And so with solemnity, we understand this and we fast together with our Lord, uh, understanding that this is one of the days of passion. This is still Samadha Hamama. This is the last day of Samadha Hamama. So um, there's a lot of beauty and a lot of tradition, a lot of ancient teachings there. Absolutely. I, I think in general, what we have to realize about that is for this to be a broken original Sabbath or first Sabbath, means that it's totally different. And so our reaction, our response has to be totally different. We can't just be, as we mentioned earlier, desensitized and comfortable Christians. We have to realize how radical this moment is. Even though, of course, it happened thousands of years ago, we are commemorating it. We are keeping its memory alive. We are keeping its memory eternal and forever by how we respond. So, there's something that N.T. Wright said that I really appreciate, the former Anglican Bishop of Durham. He said, what we need to do is throughout the Paschal season, right? And we have a more strict Paschal season than the Anglicans, of course. From now till Pentecost, we have 50 days. During these 50 days, we need to go bananas. We need to have a bonanza. We need to go all over the place and express our joy in every medium and in every way possible so that people look at us and they say, why are you so happy? Why are you so joyful? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know, we can give away possessions. We can give away food. We can sing hymns. There's an amazing video of some Lebanese from a few years ago who planned a secret uh, setup where they were all in a mall. And we can't quite see that one. They're all in the mall and they're singing Christ is risen from the dead in, in the most beautiful, uh, melodious and harm, harmonic way. A and people are staring, whatever their background, whatever their faith, they're staring and they become curious. It was these forgiving Christians in the very beginning as they were being fed to lions. It was these merciful Christians when there were only doctors making house visits for the rich who, like Basil the Great, made public hospitals for people, who reached out to the masses and did things that were transformative, did things that were so radical, so different, that people had to ask, who is the deity? Who is the God behind them? What force is moving them to have this action? And it's in that moment, we could say, it's Christ. We can say, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life and eternal rest. Mm. And we can just keep chanting that and, and letting them know what is the force? What is the spirit, the power, and the might behind why we're able to express of his victory, of his triumph? Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while he's muting the mic, uh, what you said is very true. And uh, I want to hop on that. Uh, and that is this interpretation, which is very beautiful, that things will never be the same again after this day, which is why we have this different reaction, this different response. Things will never be the same again. And in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, one of the ways uh, we celebrate how things will never be the same again is our priests on this Holy Saturday, they go around, and while they're saying he made peace with the cross, they pass around, they distribute this thing called kekema. Uh, I think in the English, it's a form of papyrus read, I believe. I'm not sure. But it's a reference to the story of Noah. And for those of us that didn't read the story of Noah or may have forgotten it, uh, Noah, you know, the obvious part of the story we all know, Noah goes into the ark, two pairs, I mean, pairs of each uh, species, uh, yada, yada, and then the flood comes. And then towards the end of the story, we read in the Bible that Noah is waiting for a sign that the waters have receded that the flood is over, that a new day has come. And what does he get as a sign from God? The dove comes with the olive branch. 
And so when he sees that, he realizes there is hope, that the only way this dove could have gotten the olive branch is if the waters had receded, that there is new life, that a new era has come. And so we, in the same way, when we receive the Ketema spiritually, since uh, during this pandemic, unfortunately, we will not be receiving physical Ketema. Spiritually, when we receive the Ketema, we should be remembering this from now on, we have hope for a new era, that a new earth and heaven await us, that Christ, the, the victor, has established for us a new way of life, that the old man is dead and the new man is now alive. And so clutching that olive branch in our hand, we should be singing, like you said, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by his own death, and upon those in the tomb, bestowing eternal life. May praise be to his name. Amen. So, I mean, that, that's a beautiful way to conclude. Our, our father, Kasis Jonas or Kasis Malaku, are, are either of you there and available to, to give us a closing prayer? We understand if not, if you're ready for the liturgical services this evening. No, okay, so it'll be on us. Yagomerat, would you like to uh, give us a closing prayer? No, I, I would give that to the, to the elder. <laughs> okay, all right. Let us gather our thoughts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Believing and trusting in the Holy Trinity and standing in the presence of our Holy Mother, the Church, we deny Satan and all of his works. And for this, Zion is our witness forever and ever. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for the time that you have given us to enter into this digital realm and to think about the Ketama plant that was given during the covenant of no, as a sign of hope, as a sign of life. We know that no matter what distresses, no matter what chaos, no matter what instability or fragility we see in our frail world, you will always have for us a sign of hope, a sign of life. If we have ears to hear your message, which you revealed to us in your sacred scriptures, in your holy writ, in your Bible, so that we may live from generation to generation, with the same teaching, with the same instruction, but with contextual and different analogies and illustrations, so that all of us can eternally and forever worship you, the only and living God. As you taught us how to pray, we will pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With the salutation of Saint Gabriel the angel, O Our Lady Mariam, peace be unto you. You are a virgin in your thoughts and a virgin in your flesh. Blessed are you amongst all women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Rejoice, joyful one, for God is with you. Pray and beg your beloved Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may grant us mercy and forgive us our sins. May the love of God the Father, the grace of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit Remain with all of us forever. Wasibhat the Xavier. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill.